Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Larson, Director of Development at the OHSE Foundation. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Nate Selden, the Mario and Edith Companion Chair of Pediatric Neurological Surgery, Department Chair and Professor of Neurological Surgery, OHSU School of Medicine, as well as Dr. Kelly Nazimi, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology, and Medical Director of the Dornbecker Pediatric Brain Tumor Program to discuss the fight against pediatric brain tumors. Before we get into the conversation, I'm quickly going to go through some housekeeping items and how you can engage with us during today's presentation. We will be using the chat function, which can be found to the right of the viewing screen. In order to participate in the chat, you can log in via your Vimeo or Facebook account or participate as a chat box guest as by selecting the chat as a guest blue link. If you need assistance at any time during this presentation, please email fdnevents at ohsu.edu. We are going to copy that into the chat box now for your reference. Please note, today's presentation will be recorded and available for viewing on the OHSU Foundation website, and we will share a link once that is available. And with that, it is my great privilege to begin today's conversation. As a mom, I count my blessings daily for my daughter's health. Working for Dornbecker, I am acutely aware of how quickly life can change and the gravity that can come with a life-threatening diagnosis. I am grateful that an institution like OHSU and Dornbecker is here in our backyard. Right here in Portland, we have some of the brightest minds in the world collectively gathering and joining forces to care for families and to give, guide them through what are likely the toughest days of their lives. Hence, I am honored to be joined by Dr. Nate Selden and Dr. Kelly Mazzini. Dr. Selden, I'd like to begin our presentation with you. Can you please speak to the successful innovations that we've seen in pediatric brain tumor treatment and what we have achieved at Dornbecker? Sure. Thanks for having me, uh, and I'd be glad to. Maybe I can start out with a couple of stories, because I think individual stories tell us a lot and speak to us um, uh, about, you know, more personally about these issues. So uh, I'm a father. I've attended uh, hundreds and hundreds of volleyball games uh, for both of my uh, girls and uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, one, one of the few games that I wasn't at, uh, my spouse was there. She's also a, a physician and a surgeon. Um, and she gave me a call and said, uh, you know, uh, Samantha is, is uh, headed to the hospital. Um, she's having some really weird uh, symptoms. And this was a close friend and, and teammate of one of my daughter's. And when she got to the hospital, it turned out that she had a, uh, a brain tumor, which is an incredibly rare diagnosis out in the world, although it's something we see here at Dornbecker and OHSU um, all the time because we're a major center for this work. Uh, it turned out that this was a, a highly sensitive tumor that required a, a very delicate and advanced resection, and that it was important to get the whole tumor out in order to um, return her to health. Um, my uh, colleague, very valued colleague, a wonderful uh, physician and surgeon, was on call. I got in touch with her and let her know that Samantha was headed her way. She, Samantha was admitted to the hospital and it, within the next uh, day or two underwent a highly sophisticated surgery in our intraoperative MRI scanner. It's one of the few in children's hospital uh, hospitals in the world. And it, what it allows a surgeon to do is to look inside the brain with the MRI during surgery, uh, even with the skull still open, to see if there's a little bit of tumor hiding around the corner or some tumor that looks to the, the naked eye or under the operating microscope like normal brain and still needs to be removed in order to make the difference for that child. And using the intraoperative MRI, my colleague uh, re removed the entire tumor in one surgery, didn't have to go back deal with additional risk, pain, discomfort, scar tissue, or complications, advance of the tumor or a tumor becoming unresectable, uh, and was able to cure this tumor, but also be incredibly gentle on Samantha's uh, brain. And in fact, within weeks, uh, I was sitting on the, uh, the bleachers with uh, watching my daughter play, and in walked Samantha with a little bit of, tiny bit of hair missing, uh, and... Uh, a beautiful incision, and uh, got up there and started playing volleyball. So that's incredible. Uh, someone who became symptomatic, 
and went in for major brain surgery to remove a tumor and within weeks was back to a full life. There are other kinds of kids, and I'll tell you about a, a, another uh, young girl who uh, I've known as well, uh, and a number of us here at Dornbecker have taken care of, named Kinsley. Kinsley came in with an unresectable tumor, uh, deep in a very sensitive area of the brain where only a partial removal is possible. So again, using advanced technology, computers to navigate in the brain, intraoperative MRI, all kinds of technology that we have, we remove portions of of tumors like this, the portions that are safe, diagnose them, and in fact, uh, these days, use very modern molecular tools to learn about the genes and the errors in those genes uh, in those tumors that cause them. And then working together with uh, Dr. Nazimi and my other pediatric colleagues in the uh, brain tumor program at Dornbecker, uh, we can, as a team, design molecularly targeted therapies that take advantage of the exact errors in the genes of these tumors and the pathways and use very specifically targeted and individually tailored drugs to really radically improve the long-term outcome of these children. So before, uh, they got partial resections and very debilitating general chemotherapy and not necessarily even good control of the tumor. Um, and in Kinsley's case, we were able to target a very effective chemotherapy that was much less damaging to her and her body as a whole, so that in a tumor we couldn't remove, we could really nevertheless bring her back to health and give her a much better prognosis for her development and on ongoing life and health. And so in both cases, uh, these approaches to these two di very different brain tumors and two very different patients uh, you know, bring a common theme, and that theme is really teamwork. So it's uh, surgeons and nurses and anesthesiologists and technicians and computer scientists and radiologists and people in the technical sphere in the operating room. It's scientists in a laboratory looking at the molecular uh, makeup of tumors and oncology specialists uh, and many other pediatric physicians designing special care programs for each child based on their individual needs. And one thing I'm really proud of at Dornbecker is that these teams work really closely together. We love working together. We admire and respect each other's expertise. Half the time you'll find Dr. Nazimi pushing for surgery and me pushing for some of her treatments um, because we're not prejudiced about what we do. We're all oriented to finding the best solution for every patient. And I think that's uh, that, that focus on the patient and not on ego or specialty is what uh, really distinguishes our program here at Dornbecker. Dr. Nazimi, what advances have been made in treating brain tumor patients and what work still needs to be done? Well, 40 years ago, when a child with a brain tumor walked through the hospital doors, they had at best a 50-50 chance of surviving. Today, with advances in surgical techniques and radiation therapy, chemotherapy, we are able to save more like 75% of kids. Of course, that chance of survival largely depends on the type of tumor that we're dealing with and also the location of the tumor. So consider the real estate that we're dealing with. Is the tumor located close to the surface of the brain, relatively accessible, or is it deeper in the brain but still removable by the right experts like Dr. Selden and his team? Or is the tumor situated in really deep structures entwined in pathways that simply cannot be removed or should not be removed, like visual pathways or pathways that allow the child to move their arms or legs, or even worse is the tumor entwined with the brainstem or the control center um, telling your lungs to breathe and your heart to beat are located. So surgical advances have been incredibly important and have allowed so many more kids to walk out the door um, and be able to return to the volleyball court or the soccer field or to choir practice. But many times the story is much more complicated. And our team here at OHSU Dornbecker is literally and truly one of the best in the country at walking with these families through whatever journey lies before them when they walk through our doors. 
and giving them the best chance at being among that 75% that we're hoping for. But stop and think about that. That still means that we are losing one out of four kids. One out of four kids, it's, it's just not acceptable. And a lot of people don't realize that brain tumors are the leading cause of cancer death in kids. And for the 75% that we do save, a lot of them, too many of them, have significant and permanent side effects from the treatments that we've needed to use to keep them alive. Some even die of a second cancer from the treatments that we've had to use. So we still have a long way to go. But I do believe that we're um, in a new era and um, a new time of hope. And I'm daring to believe that in the future, we really will be able to save every kid and allow them to live their life fully the way that they were meant to. But we do still really have a lot of hard work to do to make this a reality. Dr. Nazimi, I'm sure you've met some pretty incredible kids over the years. Can you tell us a patient story that illustrates the advances that we've made in pediatric brain tumor treatment? Yeah, I've... I've met so, so many amazing kids, um, amazing teenagers, parents, um, families, and some of those kids go through a relatively simple story where um, a benign tumor is removed and they kind of return to their life um, uh, just restored to how they were before. Um, some have survived at a very high cost and um, have to learn a new way of living. Their parents have to learn a new way of parenting. Their schools need to learn a new way to educate them. Um, so there's been a high cost to their survival. And then there are so many who have passed away, um, but obviously have had immeasur immeasurable impact on, on the people around them and honestly, the team that's taken care of them. But I will tell you one particular story because I think it really illustrates where we're at in this evolving field and kind of this molecular era that I've referred to. Um, and it just also shows that we still have a lot of work to do. So I'm going to call this little girl Penelope. When Penelope was turning four, her parents weren't planning her birthday party. They were planning um, the appointment with her new oncologist for the large brain tumor that had spread to multiple parts of her brain. Um, they learned at that appointment that the type of tumor actually wasn't very clear under the microscope um, and that they were being sent to Dornbecker to receive a really aggressive chemotherapy regimen that can only be given with the support of our bone marrow transplant team. But with advanced testing of the tumor tissue, it was learned that her tumor cells actually had this uh, very specific um, but very rare um, alteration in uh, something called NTRK, N-T-R-K, NTRK, it's an NTRK fusion, which had been recently um, found to be the reason for rapid growth of many different types of cancers. Um, and at the time that Penelope came through our doors, uh, we were participating in a new clinical trial using a medicine that could be taken by mouth. So no hospitalization, just taking this medicine at home every day and uh, specifically designed to kill tumor cells that are growing because of an NTRK fusion. So Penelope was a perfect candidate for this new treatment. And at the time that I met her, she was honestly declining really rapidly and frankly was so, so miserable because of the pressure that the tumors were causing in her brain. But within eight weeks of being on that medicine, um, these tumors completely melted away, which was just absolutely phenomenal. And we, we see that when the surgeons take it out, but it's very unusual for medicine to cause tumors to melt away like that. And the best part about that was that she was restored completely to her happy self. It was like we were meeting her for the first time. Um, she was so funny and really precocious for her age and um, made us all laugh. So unfortunately, we only got to enjoy that miracle for four months. Um, and new tumors started to grow in different parts of her brain and down into her spine as well. 
So what we're learning is that tumors that are being targeted in this way um, with these targeted treatments can find a new way to grow. Um, and we call this a resistance mechanism. So this is one of the areas, one of the uh, problems that need to be solved. Um, we need new strategies to be developed to deal with issues like that. But it is just an example of um, something new that's happening. And this new era did give Penelope um, several months of wellness that she wouldn't have otherwise have, had. And um, she was able to make it to her fifth birthday, which was something that um, everyone wanted for her. And she was feeling well on her fifth birthday with the help of some additional um, other medications, but she did die very soon after she turned five. So we do need to be able to continually advance our understanding of every clue that each child's tumor can give us about its weaknesses, especially after their story starts to unfold after they've um, started the treatment, because we need to be able to understand every molecular detail of every tumor at like each stage of their treatment. And we also need to be able to have all of those newest treatments available for our patients right when they need them, to be able to give them the best chance at a good survival without long-term damage to their developing brains and their bodies. Dr. Selden, what are some of the things Dornbecker is doing to move the needle forward on the treatment of brain tumors? Well, one of the most important things uh, is that we joined the Pacific Pediatric Neuro-Oncology Consortium. We call it PNOC uh, for short. And this is a group of uh, other institutions that share our values and approach here on the West Coast. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that we were considered sort of out there, out there west of the Rockies, sort of on the fringe, not really in the center of gravity of the most sophisticated uh, uh, pediatric hospitals in the country and, and these these sort of upstart programs out here on the West started having some good ideas and banding together to collaborate on trials of uh, new approaches to brain tumors, new approaches to molecular targeted therapy, new approaches to individualized care and running prospective, meaning, you know, organized trials that people enroll in at the beginning of their care to study these approaches and these drugs to see how we can advance beyond the standard of care and do things that are better than what's available anywhere out there today. Uh, before too long, uh, the upstart PNOC, which had been the smallest, scrappiest uh, uh, neuro-oncology consortium for kids in the US, became a real leader and Dornbecker has been a big part of that. So we um, uh, have uh, advanced that work in collaborative uh, groups of surgeons, doctors, and scientists uh, that really just moves the needle on what's capable. So kids who come in today uh, are offered treatments that absolutely did not exist uh, a few years ago. And uh, tomorrow, as new molecular data comes out and new technology emerges, they will be offered treatments and more effective ones uh, than the ones we know today. And what's really incredible is some of these uh, treatments are, are discovered or advanced or refined here as part of PNOC and uh, then spread to other centers in other parts of the United States and even the world. And that affects children that we'll never even meet. And again, I, you know, I go back to the teamwork factor. Uh, the, the greatest barrier to this kind of complex work is, is uh, you know, working as an island. And I think here in Oregon, uh, as a state, you know, we've always been oriented towards teams. Um, here at Dornbecker as an institution in particular, uh, those teams are, are very compassionate. We, we engage families in what we know and what we don't know. We explain why we are recommending investigational or experimental treatment where, where it's applicable and how, uh, what we do know, what we don't know, and how it might benefit uh, their child, what the alternatives are. We support every family's personal decision, no, no matter what it may be. And we make sure that uh, they really uh, feel heard and are able to understand uh, everything about uh, their uh, child's condition and situation and our recommendations. So it's not just, uh, again, the science, it's the compassion that goes with the science it's not just the technology, it's the teamwork that goes with the technology. 
I think, that distinguishes uh, our program here. So a big part of this teamwork is, is our brain tumor board, which started uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and then advanced to a larger group under Dr. Nazimi's leadership. And this is a, this is a, a, until COVID, a ton of people. I mean, really two dozen or more people uh, in a room. Now we're in a virtual room just like this today. Uh, and we have uh, oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, technicians, radiologists, uh, nurse practitioners, child life specialists, epilepsy experts, physiologists, um, all uh, working together to understand each case. And we're discussing all of these specialists are together at the same time, looking at the same uh, MRI scans, looking at the same data and pathology results. And the pathologists, of course, are there, our molecular specialists. And then we talk together and find the individual best solution for that um, child. And what I have found uh, is that um, people are not advocating for, for you know, their tool. Um, just because I'm a carpenter, I'm not going to say the hammer uh, and nail are best for this problem. I'm really going to sit back, listen to the opinions of all those experts who bring something different to the table uh, with a totally open mind. And as a consensus, we emerge with what we think is a really innovative a leading solution for that individual patient. And I think that gets better results and, and really increases the chance for a cure where it's possible. That's pretty incredible. I've heard um, the term Dornbecker factor be used before. Well, we think the Dornbecker factor is, is cooperation, uh, compassion, and um, high standards of care. Uh, we really don't compromise on any of those uh, three features. Thanks, Dr. Selden. Dornbecker has done a fantastic job pulling together a cohort, cohort of experts to provide comprehensive, coordinated care and treatment for brain tumor patients. Though, so Dr. Nazimi, as you mentioned, there is still a lot of work to be done. Can you speak to your, ver your vision for further advancing treatment? Yeah, I really want to emphasize that um, first and foremost, in order for us to succeed, no matter how far the scientific advances have come at you know, any given point, we need to be able to give each family that we're currently taking care of 110% from every angle at every level in all the departments that are involved. And of course, we do that with specialized nurses and doctors. That seems obvious, right? But there's actually so many other layers of expertise that are so important that can't always be covered in the hospital budget or not covered um, robustly. And um, so things like a dedicated social worker, I can't tell you how important um, that role is on our team to help families deal with their um, the rest of their life as their child's um, illness um, has kind of completely changed their lives. So both being able to kind of keep up with that process of um, helping their child get well, but also um, just dealing with everything else in life with um, insurance issues or their job issues or the other kids, um, super important role. Another one that's so important is our school teacher, um, also a school liaison who helps the child to continue with their education as much as they can while they're in the hospital or while they're in treatment. And then of course, when they're done with treatment or they're ready to reintegrate back into their school environment, um, helping to make all the adjustments that are, are needed for that. Um, it's also really important for us to have um, coordinators or um, navigators, sometimes they're called. So right now we have a nurse coordinator who um, helps to just uh, remind the families of what's coming next or just help them kind of be able to anticipate all the different things that are going to happen in the coming day, the coming week, the coming month. Um, this coordinator also helps us as medical providers kind of keep track of all the different elements of a child's treatment, and this is really important. We also need really um, specialized appointment schedulers, which sounds crazy, but um, sometimes our scheduler is working with literally 10 different hospital departments to design 
the best possible version of that child's um, day or week at OHSU to make sure that we're um, being as efficient as we can and using their time well and coordinating things well. We also need a really robust clinical trials infrastructure, which means all of the staffing that we need to be able to have clinical trials open to make these new treatments available for families. Um, so clinical research associates, data managers, uh, research nurse, and right now this is one of the areas that um, we most need to um, improve what we have for families available. These families need us to guide them with our expertise, but they also need us to navigate their journey to be as smooth as possible so that the only thing that they need to focus on is their, is their child and, and their family. And I'm going to tell you that those at Dornbecker who are committed to the brain tumor team, which is a huge number of people, find this to be deeply meaningful work. But I'm going to tell you, too, that it's really um, deeply and profoundly hard work to do this really, really well the way that we do. Um, so we need to be able to expand our staffing to sustain our best care for these children and, our, and their families both at that, those kind of basic levels, but also to enable every child to enroll in a clinical trial if that's something that might um, help them to achieve a cure or to help uh, other kids in the future um, achieve a cure. And that just takes a tremendous amount of work to get the trials open and maintain them, um, and even more work when the patients are actually on these trials and making sure that we're delivering these experimental therapies safely. And the simple truth is that we actually aren't able to keep up with everything that's available. So Dr. Selden talked about um, the clinical trials consortium that we're a part of, the PNOC. Um, and a lot of trials become available and it's actually becoming, it's such a successful consortium that there's more and more trials um, open and available to us, but we're just not able to keep up uh, with the staffing that we have in order to get all those trials open. And even the ones that we prioritize to open, uh, we're just not getting them open fast enough. And just as an example, so we have two clinical research associates who are doing all of the uh, bulk of work of maintaining those trials and keeping them open. And to have all of the trials open here in Oregon that we could, we probably need closer to five or six of these clinical research associates. Um, another factor is that we don't have a, a research nurse. So our um, amazing research or our amazing clinic nurse um, does all of that work and steps up to the plate to make sure that the patient has access to what they need. But it would be really, really helpful to have um, a, a dedicated research nurse that spends the time with those patients that need all of that care to make sure that the clinic nurse can be doing everything else um, for all the other patients. Um, so just it's, I'm just bringing those things up because they, you know, they're fairly well covered by hospital budget and school of medicine departments, but um, really having deeper layers of coordinators, navigators, schedulers is all stuff that's going to make the patient and the family experience um, so much better. Um, and same thing with the school teacher. We kind of we kind of borrow her from the hospital school program um, because she loves this patient population and we get her for half a day per week. But this population really could benefit from a school teacher that is completely dedicated to um, improving the education for these kids and helping them adjust um, as they're kind of recovering from their process, but also during their treatment. So it really does take a village to help these kids um, survive and thrive. So as we provide the best um, care that we can every day with the treatments that we do have available, um, we, we also do need to improve and continually adapt the type of testing that we're doing on each child's um, tumor. We want to be able to work with neuropathology, the um, experts who look under the microscope to tell us what type of tumor we're dealing with, and the scientists, our, our brain tumor scientists in the lab to make sure that we're harnessing the power of, especially the night diagnostic, the night cancer institute diagnostic labs, but also just making sure that we're discovering new things, testing these tumors to the level of detail um, that's needed in this current molecular era, and making sure that we're also in, able to incorporate newer testing platforms that are being developed across the country and the world 
when we determine that those are important for our patient population, we need to be able to have the resources to be able to start to incorporate that. Um, and making sure that we're basically testing every tumor for any clue that it can give us uh, to help that child survive and to do it with the least amount of side effects. Dr. Nazimi, you mentioned the need for testing in order to better understand brain tumors. Can you speak to the brain tumor research happening at Dornbecker and within the Pape Family Pediatric Research Institute? Yeah. Um, in the last two, uh, maybe three years now, we've um, had the opportunity to start bringing tumor samples from the operating room um, to the scientific labs, um, like Dr. Monica Devari's lab or Dr. Jay Cho's lab, uh, to help bring discovery um, straight from the operating room and give us opportunity to learn more about the tumors. Um, not, on, not on behalf of that, that particular patient, but for the whole population across the country and across the world. Um, the exciting thing about um, this process at Dornbecker is that the reason we were able to finally get this up and running um, was because of some funding from a grateful family um, who lost their seven-year-old son to medulloblastoma, which is the most common malignant tumor that we see in childhood. And this family has this amazing um, event every year called the Hero Up Run. It's in September every year. And um, they raise money to uh, donate to our program. And because of that, we were able to purchase the equipment that we needed um, to be able to bring the tumor tissue to the labs. And their child's name is engraved on that equipment up in the Pape Research Center at Dornbecker. There's also this beautiful um, wall of pictures that represents um, some of the children um, who have had tumor tissue uh, donated to the labs. Um, and a really, really special situation earlier this year was when Penelope's parents, the little girl that I told you about, um, made a brave decision to donate her tumor tissue after she passed away um, on hospice, um, you know, at home, but our team was able to arrange for them to make that gift. Um, and this was particularly special because Dr. Davari is an expert in uh, tumors with the NTREC fusion. So I'm really hopeful um, that that will lead to a, a discovery that will help the next child whose tumor um, stops responding to the medicine and, and when the medicine stops working, that we will have made some sort of discovery that helps us help the next child. Um, it also would be so important for us to be able to make a bigger impact um, using these don donated tumors by increasing our research power and expertise um, by recruiting more scientists for Dr. Davari and Dr. Cho and many of our other scientists at OHSU to keep working with. We must always focus first, like I talked about before, on giving the best to each child and family that we're currently taking care of while also working toward a much better future for all kids with brain tumors. And we're definitely going to need all of your help to give each child the best chance of a good survival by finding those molecular clues that the tumor can tell us and having all the new, newest treatments that these kids need available here in Oregon at OHSU when they need them. Thank you so much, Dr. Selden and Dr. Nazimi. Your expertise, dedication, and compassion has made all the difference for so many families facing this terrifying diagnosis. It is exciting to think about what is on the horizon and the strides and advancements for brain tumor treatment that are happening here in Oregon. Before we get to the viewer questions, I'd like to share a short video about one of our pediatric brain tumor patients, Sawyer Miller. In 2017, after feeling what he could only describe as a ping pong ball in his brain, 10-year-old Sawyer underwent surgery when a brain scan revealed an egg-sized tumor in his brain. Today, Sawyer is tumor-free and doing better than ever, only visiting Dornbecker for routine tests and checkups. I like to play tennis, do gymnastics. I like cooking desserts because it's fun. No. No. My name's Sawyer and I'm 12 years old. 
I started feeling symptoms of dizziness when I flipped during gymnastics. And so every time we flipped, I had to sit out. He had a significant episode the evening after Christmas in Bend. We took him to a doctor immediately. The doctor saw him kind of go dizzy when he laid him down, immediately ordered an MRI. The next day we had that, and on the way back they said, we have hard news, your son has a brain tumor. I didn't really know what it was. We were all crying. And then I just said, I don't want to do so easy. But that didn't <laughs> work. Once we checked into OHSU and met with the surgical team, he had surgery the next day. I mean, the whole thing kind of happened just like lightning. They said that it was likely an ependymoma. They said it was dangerous. They said that there was a pretty decent chance that he would lose some major neurological function. He could even die on the operating table. So we were supposed to be in surgery for 14 hours, and it ended up being seven. Doran Becker had an eye MRI machine that helped Dr. Selden be able to remove every little tiny piece of tumor. It's just incredible that we have those skilled doctors here in Oregon and that technology. I stayed at Doran Becker for seven weeks. He had about six weeks of radiation every day. He would go in for his MRI early every morning and then we would walk straight to the classroom. Going to school at Doran Becker was really fun. I got to FaceTime my class, so I felt connected. Doran Becker did treat us like family. The team there that just over the top just loved on us. It was awesome. Doran Becker is really like caring, everyone is really nice. The kid's still doing flips. He's lost no coordination. It's awesome. He's doing great. You would never know what he's gone through except for the scar on the back of his head. Doran Becker saved his life. I mean, absolutely saved his life. I'm feeling really good now. What an incredible kid and such a brave family. It's stories like Sawyer's that inspire me and fill me with hope for our future. With that, I'd like to open up our Q&A portion of the conversation today. We received multiple questions during our registration process, and I'd like to start with one of those. Dr. Selden, we recently heard about the merging of our pediatric neurosurgery program with Randall Children's Hospital's neurosurgery program. Can you share more about what this means for Dornbecker and our patients? Absolutely. It's very important in medicine to have consistency, and we do really well at treating large groups of patients using very high standards with bigger groups that work together cooperatively uh, and treat patients in the same way uh, to a very high measure. That improves safety, it improves outcomes, it allows us to bring uh, more uh, impactful technology and uh, more specialization of the practitioners doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners to bear on the problem. And so by combining Oregon's only two pediatric neurosurgery programs, uh, we actually make a program that is now one of the larger ones in the nation and uh, allows us to do really uh, even higher level work and also to make sure that that work is accessible, not just to the patients we've been treating through Dornbecker, but to all patients in the state, no matter what their insurance or health system or primary care provider. And so I think it's gonna be great uh, for uh, both hospitals. It'll be great for our doctors who will work together cooperatively as one larger team and share the, the burden of this care. Uh, and it will be most importantly great for the patients who I think will get care that's uh, un, unsurpassed anywhere in the United States. In primary care, what are the red flags we should be aware of for brain tumor workup at various ages? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really difficult because brain tumors in children, although common to a large center like us, in primary care pediatric practice are very, very rare. And so they can be hard to diagnose for parents and even excellent experienced pediatricians. Uh, the things to look for in a young child are changes in the eye movements, rapid growth of the head, lethargy, vomiting, particularly at night and in the morning, loss of developmental milestones and excessive sleepiness. As the child grows older, problems with speech, movement on one side of the body or the other, uh, seizures or headaches that they can now report to you that are consistent and, and repeating, uh, particularly again at night or in the morning, um, are real warning signs uh, that it could be something more serious 
uh, like a brain tumor. Unfortunately, of course, there's overlap with more benign conditions like uh, migraines and other things. So this can be real tricky for everyone uh, to figure out. Dr. Nazimi, do you have anything that, for, from your perspective, uh, having trained in pediatrics as well as in uh, neuro-oncology to add to that? I think the only thing to add is that, unfortunately, like you said, headaches are so common in um, the pediatric population and especially in teenagers. And so I think um, getting really comfortable with just a, a short neurologic exam and really honestly even being able to have them track your finger with um, eye movements. So I think like headache is super common, but be getting comfortable with looking at the back of the eye for uh, swelling of the optic disc is, is really helpful. Or if um, having an ophthalmologist see them, if, if that's not a comfortable exam, um, or just looking for in, in a story with a child that has a headache, looking for those other things. Is there any asymmetry um, in the way that they're moving or weakness that they've noticed or changes to their sensation or uh, changes to their eye movements. And I will also say that any, any new eye movement abnormality really needs to be evaluated by an ophthalmologist. Um, even if it's just thought to be a lazy eye, sometimes that it is a new cranial nerve abnormality and um, that needs to be evaluated with an MRI. I completely agree. What words of encouragement do you provide families who are facing a new diagnosis in an uncertain future? That's a really good question. Um, we try really hard to only say things to families that um, are relevant, and sometimes that, that takes patience, and we have to tell the families as soon as we know exactly what we're dealing with, we will tell you what to expect and what we're going to do about it. I think one of the hardest times for families is that point where the tumor has been removed or it's been biopsied, but we don't have the final answer of what it is exactly. And the families are so desperate to know what the next steps are and whether their child is going to survive. So um, a lot of times during that period, um, we just have to reassure them that they are in a really good place um, and that our team is an amazing team, but we're also really well connected with um, colleagues all across the country and that um, we're all working for the best um, possible treatments for these um, children. And we want to make sure that they know that we are the team that is here with them walking on whatever journey lies ahead for them. Well, uh, getting the diagnosis of a brain or spinal cord tumor is devastating uh, to parents and anxiety provoking and sad. Uh, but the good news is that even when I started in neurosurgery, uh, this was a 50-50 uh, proposition. Uh, not too long before that, it was a 30-70 a losing proposition. And we've turned that around to a 70 uh, or even better percent uh, to 30% uh, winning proposition in terms of long-term cure of uh, pediatric uh, brain tumors. And that's a terrific advance, and that advance continues with uh, things like molecular diagnosis, uh, with intraoperative MR, with uh, robotic and uh, stereotactic assisted surgery, and all of the, the new uh, cancer drugs that are uh, being released. So this is a great time, and the odds continue to improve. Uh, obviously, the exact diagnosis for each tumor is really important, and we often don't know that until after surgery. But the words, uh, your child has a brain tumor, no longer mean that the chances are greater than not that they'll pass away from it. They actually mean the chances are greater than not that we're going to cure it. Uh, and that, I think, gives real optimism to uh, parents and obviously to our care teams as well. Dr. Seldon, the IMRI has improved outcomes of neurosurgery and reduced the need for patients to have multiple surgeries. Are there any other technological advances in the world of neurosurgery that you are excited about? There are tremendous advances. A lot of uh, brain tumors uh, cause epilepsy, and we now have incredible non-invasive and invasive methods to localize the source of seizures in the brain, including using a robot to implant electrodes, using a very um, specialty advanced imaging 
uh, with uh, MRI and with radio tracers to localize abnormal activity in the brain. And all of these help us treat not only the tumor cells themselves, uh, but the seizures that they can cause. Um, we have uh, incredible computers to help us navigate through the brain, which we can use together with the intraoperative MRI scan to make sure that those brain maps are updated in real time uh, during surgery. And then, of course, you know, there's a human factor. We have here at uh, Dornbecker an incredible a team that Dr. Nazimi leads the medical part of, uh, which is involved in getting together with surgeons and technicians and radiologists and um, uh, uh, ophthalmologists and child life specialists uh, and radiation oncologists to make uh, incredibly nuanced and important decisions for a child's life and their family's life and care to make sure that we give every child the best thinking and the highest chance of not only a cure, but of preserving their of preserving them, preserving their neurological function and their condition and their quality of life. And so really, uh, technology is great, but the human factor uh, and making sure we use that technology and science in the best possible way tailored to each child's individual case is equally important. And I think uh, we're very proud of using both of those tools here at Dornbecker. Dr. Nazimi, are there any therapeutics being developed that seem especially promising for treatment of brain tumors? Yeah, um, we've talked about some of the targeted therapies already. I gave one specific example in um, Penelope's story, but um, that was about a very rare fusion, but there's actually a much more common fusion in some of the low-grade tumors that we deal with um, that can't be removed completely. So these become a chronic disease because they can't be surgically removed that we are um, using multiple chemotherapy regimens on, usually for patients that are in our outpatient clinic. Um, but there is a lot of work going on with development um, of inhibitors of that common pathway. And so I think it's true that pretty soon we're not going to be using standard chemotherapy um, for those types of patients anymore, which will really be good for their um, long-term outcomes um, and long-term side effects. There's also a really um, exciting kind of more cutting edge therapy along the lines of using our immune system to fight tumors that we haven't been able to find good uh, treatments for. Um, and one particular way that that's being done is something called CAR T cells or um, chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cells. And this is essentially something that's training the body's own immune system to recognize the tumor cells as something that's foreign and treating it like an infection basically um, so that the body will attack it on its own. So that's something that's really excited being developed um, you know, for specific mutations or specific um, proteins that are present in the tumor cells. In what ways has philanthropy played a role in the program and where could you use more support? Are there any new projects that need funding? Well, you've um, heard about the Hero Up Run, and that obviously has had a huge impact on our program. Um, we've also had um, gifts from certain families who um, have allowed us to be able to uh, fund small startup projects among our program uh, members. So things that aren't quite ready for like a big grant or even a medium-sized grant, we've been able to give 5000 10000 um, to program members who have an idea that they kind of want to get started up and it helps them um, get some initial data so that they can start going for those um, bigger grants. Um, I think the areas that we need um, the most um, help from um, in, in philanthropic gifts are the clinical trials infrastructure that I talked about. So um, I know it's like not always... Um, sexy to talk about staffing, but um, like I said, to have to have the clinical trials infrastructure in order to have all the clinical trials open so that patients can actually have access to those new medicines um, here in Oregon and not have to send them away to a different site um, is really important. Um, so I think having are uh, having a research nurse in place, having those uh, having more clinical research associates um, and partnering with um, donors to be able to make those available, adding um, 
a coordinator, navigator for uh, the patients and their journey. Um, having that school teacher fully funded to completely focus on the brain tumor population. Um, having uh, resources to do deeper analysis on all of our tumor specimens. Uh, making sure that we're able to um, pay for the newer testing platforms that I talked about. Um, and then actually a, another huge area um, that could use some significant partnership uh, in philanthropy is the proton beam radiation therapy. Um, this is a, a newer technique, not that new anymore, but um, that uh, helps us to tighten um, where we're treating uh, a child who needs radiation therapy and making sure that we're only exposing um, the tumor and limiting how much uh, radiation therapy is given to the rest of the child's body. Um, and this is something that we don't have at OHSU. Um, this would be on the scale of the intraoperative um, MRI, that type of project, but that's a, that's a huge area that I know that our colleague, Dr. Jerry Jaboyne and Dr. Blair Murphy um, want to be able to have that available. Right now we're sending um, the patients that need that are having to live in Seattle for six to seven weeks to get that therapy before they can come back home and finish their therapy. I'd imagine that caring for seriously ill children comes with a lot of stress and heartache. How do you cope and practice self-care? And Dr. Nazimi, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I was thinking pra practice is a really good word for it. Um, I'm sure Dr. Selden will attest to this too, that um, it, it really comes in waves of sometimes doing this well and um, sometimes not doing it well. Um, I actually find it funny because people um, send trainees to me to discuss work-life balance because everyone, <laughs> everyone thinks I'm good at it. Um, and it, I do think that I have taken a lot of measures to um, try to, to continually get better at it. Um, I'm someone who's, uh, especially in the last uh, three years or so, literally tried um, everything to find balance, and sometimes certain things work and sometimes certain things don't, but um, I've used um, exercise, I love walking, um, I've done meditation, I've done prayer, I've even tried acupuncture, which I never thought I would do. Um, obviously being, uh, oh, actually I should add, I've had counseling for some periods of time. I mean, we're, we're real human beings and like walking these journeys to the depth that we um, feel passionate about with these, with these families, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a calling and, um, it's challenging as well. Um, we really depend on each other. I know Dr. Selden um, can attest to that. Um, having our team meetings, I will say that that um, one of the impacts of COVID that's been unexpectedly hard is losing that like face-to-face -face interaction with our um, teammates and um, being together as we're supporting families. Um, that's, that's a really important part. And obviously our families, um, are really important to us and making sure that we are prioritizing those um, that we love at home as well so that we can continue to love these patients. That's a really uh, good answer, Kelly. And I think uh, we need to uh, attend to all these things and use all these tools. And many, many on that list uh, are things that I have used as well. This, I think, is the greatest single uh, challenge for medicine today. Um, medicine has not been uh, an appropriate uh, venue for the health of physicians and, and other practitioners. And that's something that we have to reform. And, and in my work as a leader in neurosurgery and in medicine, that's been one of my main um, goals. And it's also been a personal goal. I have gotten the balance wrong uh, much uh, of the time and right uh, at times and you know, continue to work on this very uh, mindfully and intentionally, just like Dr. Nazimi described. And most importantly, I want to uh, mentor younger colleagues, uh, and I want to make sure our teams are um, adequately staffed to support each other uh, and to um, uh, be ready to attend to ourselves, our patients, our families, in exactly the way that we would want uh, for you know, for others and, and for ourselves. So this is a super, super important 
uh, moment, even before COVID, and something that um, is going to remain a big priority. What made you choose the field of pediatrics? Well, uh, pediatrics chose me. Uh, I was a, uh, a PhD uh, neuroscientist uh, when I decided uh, just at the end of my graduate degree to go ahead and go to medical school as well. I actually had my PhD before I started medical school, and I planned to be a neurologist, uh, which is what most uh, PhD and MD holders in, in neuroscience do. Um, but I found very early uh, in my clinical rotations in medical school that I loved surgery. Then I got to, so I pivoted at the last minute and aimed at uh, neurosurgery. Uh, one of my later rotations after that decision was pediatrics, and actually the pediatricians uh, approached me. Um, I thought I'd done something wrong. They called me into a room. All the all the faculty, the professors were sitting around. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm about to. Because pediatricians okay. are always so scary. <laughs> well, I you know I, I didn't know, and I, I literally thought, oh, I did something wrong. Or and they actually said, you know, we think uh, we think uh, we're meeting with you separately and privately because we're not sure what your specialty is, but we really think you're suited to children. Um, and uh, you should go into pediatrics. I said, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. But then five years later, I was doing my pediatric neurosurgery rotation in neurosurgery. And the chief, who's a mentor of mine to this day uh, of pediatrics, pulled me aside uh, and said, you know, the nurses came and talked to me about your pre-rounding. And I said, oh, no, am I doing something wrong? Did I miss something on one of the patients? And she's like, no, they, they said that you play with the babies and shake their rattles and things when you're on rounds and the nurses think you ought to do pediatrics. And I, you know, and I thought, well, well I'm getting a consistent message here. Uh, I, you know, I was not interested in developmental neuroscience, which is, you know, what would the science that would go along with pediatrics. I'm still not. Um, but I just like taking care of these patients and the people around me get it. It reduces my stress. It makes me feel better about the work I do. So I'm going to do this. So that's interesting. I love hearing that story. I I came from the uh, mindset that I, I just always loved being around kids. So I kind of started medical school with that in mind. Uh, my problem actually was that when I did every rotation, I, I loved everything except for except for a couple things, but I, I won't name them. But um, in the end, I kind of just had to go with my gut instinct that like I was meant to to work with kids. And so that brought me to pediatrics. And I loved the long-term relationship that pediatricians were able to have over time with a child. Um, but over time, I realized that um, I wasn't so interested in the very important work of the well-child checks, um, but I, I still wanted that long-term relationship. And so oncology um, really called to me because it it did allow me to develop a relationship with these families and um, the the neuro oncology part of it came because I loved neuroanatomy in medical school I was like the nerd I was that nerd um, Nate I'm sure you had them in your class uh, and maybe you were one of them too but I, I had my them. my own <laughs> sketch of each cranial nerve and all the bazillions of branches which I've long forgot um, except for the ones I need to know but um, you know, I I loved that kind of inherently, but I also this population just um, drew me in. Um, it's a population that that can be very hard to take care of, and it takes a really special group of people to do that. And um, that that's exactly what drew me to it. How do you balance clinical care with leadership roles? So that's a great question, and one of the dangers is getting uh, you know going back to. Um, balance is getting too busy with both. And so um, uh, as I've gone along and taken on a lot of leadership duties uh, here at OHSU and also in neurosurgery nationally, I have gotten a lot better at um, literally sitting down and looking at my day-to-day -day schedule as well as, you know, what an HR person would refer to as FTE, full-time equivalent, and make sure that my full-time equivalent is one or, you know, maybe 1.2, but it's not 1.8. Um, and so if I agree to take on a major new role, then I know that I'm going to give up something else. 
Um, but I love caring for patients, so I've sort of put a floor on that that I won't go below, and that's caused me to turn down certain uh, leadership roles, not to take everything that comes along, and uh, to take the ones that are really important to me and where I think I have a, a, an ability to make a difference and, and uh, some degree of talent in that area uh, and interest, so it'll make it enjoyable and, and reinforcing for me. So those are difficult choices, but uh, important ones. Yeah, that's, I like that answer. I, um, the only thing I will add is that, and I know that you do this too, um, for both of us, the patient's needs come first. Um, so that is why we have to be careful about the other things we say yes to. But um, building a trusted team is something that I think Dr. Selden and I both have worked very hard at in our departments. And um learning to delegate to people who have proven that they are excellent at what they do and allowing them to thrive in their roles um, and giving them the autonomy and and trust to to um, be a part of this team that takes care of these patients and ditching the hierarchy of the different roles and just recognizing that everybody's got an expertise um, and different training that that can be helpful. And so, learning to trust that team and build the right team is really important. Thank you again, Dr. Selden and Dr. Nazini, for sitting down with me today and answering our questions and for sharing your stories, struggles, and visions for the future. I am inspired by you both and never cease to be amazed by the compassion with which our providers lead. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. Before we close, I invite you to please share your feedback on today's presentation. In the chat box, you will see a link to our quick feedback survey. We would very much appreciate you taking a few minutes to fill that out. Additionally, if you would like more information about the Pediatric Brain Tumor Program, the Department of Neurosurgery, or any of the groundbreaking research happening at OHSU Dornbecker, please share your name and contact information in, in the survey, and a member of the team will follow up with you. With that, this concludes our webinar. Thank you for participating, and have a wonderful day.